when you focus on the past, that's your ego. I did this. We were able to beat this team 4-0. I did this in the past. I won that in the past. And when I focus on the future, that's my pride. Yeah, next game, game five, I'll do this and this and this. I'm going to dominate. That's your pride talking. And I kind of like to try to focus in the moment, in the present. And that, that's humility. John Gennaro, count me in! One, two, one, two, three. Today's first word belonged to Giannis Aradacumpo. Admittedly, a departure from the indie rock bands we usually feature in this space, but I think a pretty good one. The rest of the words, though, belong to me. Welcome to Divine Intervention, a self-help podcast about basketball. My name is Dan Devine, and before we get rolling, here are three things that I am grateful for today. Number one, I get paid by Yahoo Sports to write about the NBA and talk about it into this microphone and into that camera. Pretty good deal. Number two, remembering to get an exact count before the start of the Easter egg hunt this year. Nobody's trying to spend their entire Sunday moving furniture around because I didn't write down whether it was 64 or 66, and nobody's trying to find a plastic oval filled with disgusting melted goo sometime around late September, at least not again. Lesson learned this year, wrote it down, nice. And number three, more important than all of that, I get to spend part of my morning with somebody who, for my money, and I'm gonna go on the record here, is a lot better than disgusting melted goo. My guest today began blogging about the Milwaukee Bucks back before I even knew that could be a thing you could do. He co-founded Brew Hoop all the way back in 2008, helping establish the template for NBA team blogging with his obsessive, relentless, intelligent, and fun coverage of a team that for a very long time did not reciprocate all that love <laughs> that he put into it. Things have gotten a lot better, though, since that Giannis guy from up top showed up. And these days, you can catch him offering that same kind of obsessive, intelligent, fun analysis of the local squad as one of the hosts of the Locked on Bucks podcast. Friends, please give a warm welcome to Frank Madden. Frank, thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, Dan. And, you know, always good to reunite with one of the other. I mean, you kind of made me sound out like the real old head here, um, but I'm going to pull you in as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I don't think you were that far behind uh, in terms of uh, when I started writing about the Milwaukee Bucks, which um, I, I, I started on a blog spot in the summer of 2007, which was a very exciting summer for the Milwaukee Bucks because you had E. Jen Lien and his you know domination of chairs. And will he <laughs> actually come to the state of Wisconsin? Uh, and there were other just really kind of historically uh, relevant things going on, like Charlie Bell. Uh, agitating for a new contract and saying he was going to go to Greece and Mo Williams getting a new contract. Just really exciting times, which um, needless to say, back then, uh, I could never have conceived of the Milwaukee Bucks having a player like Giannis or winning a championship. Um, and I don't I don't know if I can go back to those days at any point, uh, Dan, but um, <laughs> let's just say we've come a long way and uh, to go from there to, you know, watching this team win an NBA championship, getting to go to game six in 2021. Um, it's so uh, cool. It's been a journey, man. It's been a journey. And uh, it's been, uh, needless to say, an interesting few years since then, too. Well, I can understand also the like, you know, I'm not going back. There's a sense of like, you know, you get out of prison, you know, the cops aren't taking me like I'm with all due respect to Charlie Bell's contract situation. Uh, we're not going back to those days. We've, we've come too far. Um, well, I've asked you here today to discuss some of that, you know, the the distance traveled. Um, Giannis delivered our first words, today's first words during the 2021 NBA finals. And a lot has happened with the Milwaukee Bucks since then. Um, and while we enter April with the Bucks basically about where we probably imagine they might be before the start of the season, like 20 games over 500, second in the East, top five offense, Giannis for MVP. Damian Lillard, by the way, is around and he's looking like 25 and seven and great crunch time score, all that kind of stuff. I think it's fair to say that the path to get here has been dramatically <laughs> different than anyone would have charted uh, back in September. So uh, I'm interested in finding out from somebody who's lived and breathed uh, every second of that, what that experience has felt like. And if any of it even matters at this point, because we are where we are with the team we've got, and it's a pretty friggin' good one. Um, so we're gonna get into that. But before we do, here on Divine Intervention, we always try to operate from a place of joy. So Frank Madden, what is something from the world of basketball that has brought you joy this week? I mean, th there are some options to choose from. Uh, Bobby Portis had his first alley-oop dunk uh, in his Bucks tenure, <laughs> which, which surprisingly he admitted that Chris Middleton threw him an alley-oop, and uh, Chris Middleton, I think, I think actually Jared Dubin 
friend of this podcast who was recently mm-hmm. on a wrote about Chris Middleton and Giannis um, in his newsletter today. Uh, those two have an incredible uh, connection that they've forged over the past decade. And, you know, Chris understands that you just throw the ball up for Giannis and he goes and gets it. Uh, Bobby Portis, a little tougher to throw a good alley-oop to, but Chris managed to do that this week. So that was nice. You know, AJ Green, uh, I'm enjoying, uh, of course, the shooting of AJ Green. Finally, uh, not the Bucks young player that we thought would get, would get minutes this year, but the only one that has broken through in any meaningful way. But I appreciate AJ Green's defense, Dan. My appreciation has let's been. Let's go in sicko the, mode here. Let's talk. It, let's talk about AJ Green getting over screens. Let's do you know, this. You know, uh, nobody's going to get racially profiled on defense as much as AJ Green. <laughs> That's right. People are going to attack him. They're going to say like Dame Lillard. Why would I attack Dame Lillard when I can attack AJ Green? Look at this guy. Um, but pretty strong. Moves his feet. Hashtag coach's son. You know all the uh, stereotypical <laughs> stuff you would say about the. Scrappy white guy. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm racial profiling him in a different way there. But um, he's been surprisingly solid on both ends. And, um, you know, against all odds has has continued to get occasional minutes. Not, not I would say, the regular minutes that maybe some Bucks fans would like. But all that aside, when I think about Joy, there's only one person we can talk about when you think about Joy and the Milwaukee Bucks. And it obviously has to do with Giannis Dedekumbo and you know, I think if, if people watch kind of night to night, there have been games and I've been complaining on Twitter, you know, certain games like the Warriors game, um, the game against Brooklyn like a week and a half ago. He's been on the on the injury report like every game for like two months now with like various things. There was Achilles soreness, a shoulder, back, um, his right knee tendonitis, which he's had for like a decade. He had knee surgery on his left knee, which seems to have gone quite well, but the right knee has always been a kind of chronic problem. But Last couple of games, it feels like he's back to looking like the honest that we know and love. And Chris Middleton being back, throwing him alley oops from all angles, having that you know connection that um, I could only hope that Damian Lillard <laughs> could forge with him as well. Uh, but you know, I think just with Giannis, especially if you're you're a Bucks fan, you kind of and you just watch him night in and night out. I think you just sometimes you know need to just like once a week just step back and just say, okay, we got to appreciate what this guy is doing and. Obviously, he's in the MVP discussion every year. I think his his skills and, and what he does does tend to get taken for granted a bit, sort of at the macro level, um, because, again, like there's no precedent for a player doing the kind of stuff that he does, and especially in the open court. But even just like this, the, the things that he can do with the ball as a, as a ball handler, as a passer at seven feet tall... You know, this is why this skill thing, Dan, this this is part that doesn't give me joy. But like the the whole like thing about Giannis and skill, when did skill just become mid range jumpers, Dan? Like why why is that <laughs> why is that why is that the only, you know, conduit for figuring out if somebody has has quote unquote skill in basketball? Um, I think he's outrageously skilled and you know, find me a guy his size who can handle the ball and pass on the move like he has in the history of the sport. The only guy anybody ever talks about is KD, who's obviously kind of a different type of player. You can say he's about Giannis's height. But other than that, again, the amount of times this guy just takes the ball and goes end to end dunks. Um, I don't see JaVale McGee doing that, Dan. You know, I don't see anybody in the history of sport doing that. And only only because of haters who wouldn't <laughs> give him the opportunity to do so. Kareem Kareem made a comment like a year or two ago and he was like, oh, I wish I wish I had coaches who encouraged me to dribble the ball up, you know, like Giannis. And I just wanted to be like, Kareem, you're incredible. But like, <laughs> it's not just like practice and then you can go do what Giannis does. Because if you could, <laughs> somebody else would be doing it and nobody else has done it. So Giannis always brings joy. And I think this season in particular, with all the craziness and the ups and downs, he is the metronome of this team. 30 points every night, 60% shooting or better. Um, he's been incredible this year, perhaps his best season as a pro. And um, to be doing this uh, again, just every year has just been a joy to watch. And obviously it was something that, you know, we hope we continue to see for quite a long time in Milwaukee. Well, we're going to put a pin in that because it, we obviously Giannis is a significant part of the larger conversation about the Bucks. But um, I'm, I'm going to call my own number here for a real quick ISO joy. Um, I don't often do this, but uh, I've got something where I'm, I'm going to be writing about the Houston Rockets this week. Um, I don't We might have missed the window on the specific Rockets point, but I kind of like that you get to a point in the year like everyone knows what the situation is by 
late March, early April. Like, yes, there are races to decide and there's, you know, seeding battles and stuff like that. But very rarely do you get something that kind of comes out of nowhere as like a holy shit, all of a sudden this thing is something to pay attention to. And like it's re it's been really nice to have the Rockets over the last month just sort of assert themselves in the discourse in a way that they have not been since James Harden was there. And by the end of that time, the discourse was not good about the Houston Rockets. <laughs> Granted, this it was a March schedule that was laden with cupcakes. And they, I think they had a couple of games against like each of the Spurs, Jazz, Wizards and Blazers. That's helpful. But even so, like 11 game winning streak late in the season for a bunch of young guys, especially after they lose maybe their best player. That's like a fun story to pay attention to. It, it's a nice sort of, um, you know, change of pace or palate cleanser from like, all right, well, we know that the conversations are about who does, you know, who's got the best chance of knocking off Boston? What's going to be the the one through three seating in the West? Who's going to make the play in bracket? Is it a disaster if this team doesn't make X, Y, or Z thing happen? Like we kind of get that. And then all of a sudden on the outside rail, here comes the friggin' Rockets. The idea like all of a sudden, meaningful April basketball, a chance to play for something, maybe a couple of different pathways to, uh, you know, an identity. Again, they haven't really had one of those since James Harden wanted to get out of town. And so like there's there's the version of the team that plays through their mini Jokic. There's the version of the team that is five out with wings and athletes all over the place and bombs threes and plays fast. They have the ability to kind of go in whichever direction they want to there. More young talent on board with, uh, you know, we haven't seen Tari Eason in a while. We haven't seen Cam Whitmore very much. There's a ton of draft equity coming from the Brooklyn Nets, uh, which looks like that, including an unprotected pick in this year's draft, which is going to be at, at, at worst a high lottery pick, probably. You know, there's just a lot of reason to actually pay attention to what's happening in Houston, which there haven't been many of those for the last couple of years. And I think that's like a welcome change. So whether this ends in tears or not, whether this ends in catching the Golden State Warriors or not, even by sort of if they wind up losing out the rest of the way, I kind of feel like the Rockets have won in some grander sense than they've won in the last few years. You can tell me if you think that that's ridiculous, Frank. I'm, I'm willing to be poked fun at. So my uh, listeners of longtime listeners of, of me on podcast will know that my wife is a Rockets fan. She's from Houston. Mm. So I default my second favorite team um, out of marital obligation has been the Houston Rockets for you know the past decade. And especially towards the end of the Harden era, and when there was, especially, you know, there was that Giannis Harden friction, the run and dunk stuff, like... Yeah, as you talk about the bag discourse, a lot of that started uh, with the with the Harden MVP just, just So much ignorance, so much ignorance from James Harden on that front. Um, so that, that you know, caused some, not, I wouldn't say friction in my household, but, um, you know, it was not great. <laughs> so the fact that the Rockets are now legitimately fun and interesting and are not featuring James Harden. Thank God they didn't re-sign him last summer, which feels like a million years ago. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm very much all in on, on this next version of the Rockets. And an interesting sliding doors, you know, not to make everything buck centric, but one of it my biggest... That's what we're here for. That's well, totally that's, fine, Frank. That's true. One of my biggest kind of what ifs of the summer was, what if Ime Udoka doesn't take the Rockets job immediately at the beginning of May? I think he took that job maybe a couple days before the Bucks officially fired Mike Budenholzer. And Ime was kind of the guy that I looked at and said, like, wouldn't he be a great fit in Milwaukee when at the time, you know, after as soon as they lost in the playoffs, obviously it kind of felt like, OK, this is probably it for Bud. The time has probably passed on his tenure in Milwaukee. And so if he holds out another week and the Bucks maybe insert themselves into the Ime Udoka sweepstakes, I don't know. Would, how would Ime have felt about maybe joining the Bucks um, after his departure from Boston and maybe sticking it to his old team? We'll never know, but I think he would have been a great fit in Milwaukee. And uh, instead, we had a much more eventful uh, summer and fall and winter uh, than we probably bargained for in Milwaukee. And, you know, with any luck, maybe into spring. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see how it all works out. Um, not to wish any evil on anybody. It's certainly not an, an esteemed guest of the program. But, uh, no, you're uh, a graceful dovetail. Thank you very much for that for the transition to the Milwaukee Bucks, who, like, on one level, tied for the fifth best record in the NBA, have one of the two, three, four best players in the world, depending on how much you want to get yelled at on Twitter. Um, they're moving at like a 50 plus win clip for the sixth straight year, even amid all the furniture moving around in the front office and in the coaching staff. One of the small handful of teams with a real chance to win a championship. But has all of it felt like that this season, you know, like with all the 
Adrian Griffin, and then in comes Terry Stotts, out goes Terry Stotts. In comes Damian Lillard, out goes Drew Holiday. Ah, you know, like the the push and pull, the, st- the, the stop and start of it all. Has it felt like that, um, or in the context of the last like 11 months and all the upheaval, is it, is it, has it been as like, difficult to enjoy it in the same way? As you knew, you mentioned Giannis is that font of joy. Everything else going on around it, has it been difficult to sort of say like, I still root for one of the best teams in the world, even as you're sort of seeing all the things grind uh, on their way there. Yeah. I mean, I think if you go back to, you know, last summer and kind of all the kind of things that got set in motion with the pretty shocking loss to the Heat, although, again, with Giannis being injured in, you know, the first half of the first game, obviously everything kind of went up for grabs after that. And, you know, my philosophy in general, the thing I always say about the playoffs is, you know, the playoffs are just a series of small sample sizes, right? Like every series has its own flavor, matchups, Teams can look dominant and world beaters in one series, and then they look disappointing and what's wrong with them in the next series. So I try not to kind of, you know, react too much to, to things. And obviously there were circumstances to what happened with the Bucs. Um, but I think certainly as soon as they went the Adrian Griffin direction, I think that was an eyebrow raising <laughs> decision given where this team is and the pressure that was on them. Um, I think that led to certainly some anxiety like, well, let's see how this works out. Um and put a lot of pressure on the veterans on this team to obviously like, you know, buckle down and buy in and make sure that whatever bumps that came with having a young and experienced head coach who you really didn't know if he was going to be ready for this job or not, that they were able to kind of smooth through that. And then, you know, trading Drew Holiday for, for Damian Lillard, pretty much out of the blue, right before training camp starts. When it happened, I was just kind of in silence. You know, I know a lot of Bucks fans were super excited because it's Damian freaking Lillard sure. and you know, like we love you, Drew, but you know, Drew's turned into a pumpkin for, as a, as an offensive player, every postseason, including when they won the championship um, for some reason, he just, you know, at least in Milwaukee, we'll see what happens in Boston. Um, you know, his, his efficiency as a scorer just completely tanked, whether it's because of the defensive effort that he has to put out, whatever. So addressing, you know, basically saying like, all right, you don't like Drew Holiday's offense. Here's Damian Lillard. See, see if you like that a little bit better, right? Here's the most offense. <laughs> Here's all of the offense and maybe a little bit less of the defense. Um, so there was obviously just a huge amount of, you know, moving parts um, or two enormous moving parts, even though they did kind of otherwise sort of what they needed to do. They didn't have much flexibility. They brought back Brook Lopez, nearly losing him to the Houston Rockets. Right. Yeah. The other sliding doors moment there with the Houston connection. Exactly. You know, if, if they lose Brook you know, what direction they go in there is, is a big question. Uh, they bring back Chris Middleton, um, after obviously some stop start couple seasons for him with injuries. Um, so they kind of did like all that they could do to make sure that they had as much talent as possible. And then to go into the season, then, you know, kind of expecting, all right, with all the Giannis noise over the summer, which feels like a million years ago, you know, you expect that there's going to be, you know, night to night is going to be a referendum on is Giannis going to want to stay here long term. And thank freaking God that he signs that extension surprisingly, right? Like we all thought like, oh, it doesn't, he doesn't really need to do this this year. He can keep the pressure on the organization, et cetera. And then to basically say like, ah, screw it. I'll sign the extension, right? Like that was, I think now it's like, we, we kind of forget about how important that was. It, it almost got glossed over even when it happened <laughs> because it was like, right. I think a lot of the national folks probably felt like, oh man, that was a fun storyline that we we're, you know, enjoying talking about. <laughs> so, um, so it's kind of interesting. So there was a lot of like upheaval, but then the Giannis piece obviously stabilized things. Um, but, you know, I think I, I got to say, like, I mean, you know, right from, you know, let, like mid training camp to the Stotts departure, the vibes that I got from people around the organization were uniformly concerning. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I talk to people who kind of are outside you know, in the NBA, but sort of outside and know people and people who are close to the Bucks and things like that. And nobody was telling me like, oh, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He'll figure it out. You know, like it's, it's going to be fine. Right. Everybody was just like, this doesn't look so good. And um, so I don't know. So it, it just felt like there was kind of this cloud and, and Adrian Griffin actually referred to that, you know, like, as a cloud that was falling them around early in the season. And um you know, it was just a, a very kind of disjointed start to the season. And keep in mind, I mean, this team historically has been one of the most boring in a good way that is out there, <laughs> right. right? Like they're just like clockwork with Bud, you know, Giannis, Chris, 
drew for most of that period. Brooke Lopez, you kind of knew what you were going to get. Bunch of like good guys, not causing problems. Um, and, you know, got you 50 plus wins every year and had you in the conversation for a championship. So, um, you know, the intrigue of adding Dame, the potential disruption of having a rookie coach. Um, obviously, it was a, a much more talked about team than than certainly it has been in previous years and just fundamentally like a big shift from where they were previously. And I think, you know, I, I think what we saw was that people, you know, Giannis, probably the other veterans on the team probably took for granted a lot of what Bud brought and the stability of having a professional kind of system that, that he brought to the team. So, so yeah, I mean, like, you know, obviously we can d- debate kind of Adrian Griffin and, and all that kind of do the autopsy on that for, you know, the next two hours, but, you know, it was challenging and to their credit, they still won a bunch of games, but not in the way that, that I think you would expect. But again, it's, it's just really hard now because I think when you judge this team, like I've got, you know, bookmarked uh, pages on cleaning the glass and NBA.com from before and after the firing of Adrian Griffin, right? Because right. like, we're trying to sort out like, well, okay, there was this version of the team before the move. There's this version of the team after the move, after the move, like they haven't really won that many games, but there are, I'd say some important differences that are encouraging. And Chris Middleton's been hurt. And there's also been change in officiating that happened around the time of that move, which has impacted, I'd say, Damian Lillard as much as anybody. So, um, so yeah, it's just been a lot. And I'll, I'll leave it kind of with one, with one kind of idea here before kind of pausing. But I think the, the, the case for the Milwaukee Bucks is title contenders. The glass half full argument is not a like, well, since Stock Rivers showed up, like everything's changed discussion. To me, the, the kind of two overriding themes are one, when the Bucks' best players play, they're really, really good, right? They have, if you look at the top five man lineups in the league, they have the best one. <laughs> like if you look at the ones I think above, you know, a thousand possessions on cleaning the glass, you know, they're, they're starting five. I think they're plus 16 net rating. It's better than the Celtics best, best five. You know, I'm not saying that they're better than the Celtics, but when they have their, their best five out there, they've been great. And they've actually defended well. They've scored a ton and they've actually defended well too, which maybe doesn't pass the eye test of, of Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley being your starting two guards. But, um, but they've been really good. And the, the trio of Middleton, Giannis and Chris or Middleton, Giannis and Dame, they've been, they're now actually the second best. They were the, the top trio in the league for the longest time. And then Dan, your Knicks, Isaiah Hartenstein, uh, I said Rick Brunson, almost Jalen Brunson and, I forget who the third guy is. One of your third starters, uh, Josh Hart, probably. They, yeah. they now have, are just ahead of them in terms of net rating among trios, like plus 17 something. So those guys have been great. And that's not been a like Doc Rivers magically turned them into a good group. They've done right. that all year. Um, and really, it's been like the bench groups and everything like that. Like basically, as soon as you take the starting five out, then like everything gets weird. And I think that's where the lack of system and organization really hurt them, especially during the Griffin era. So that's, that's I'd say, you know, best players being great, I'd say is definitely part of it. And then I think the other one too is they've been way better against good teams than bad teams, relatively mm. speaking. And, you know, up until I think the loss um, against the New Orleans Pelicans, they were first in terms of net rating against top 10 teams. They dropped them to second behind the Thunder. Uh, they jumped the Thunder when they wrecked the Thunder um, a week ago um, in Milwaukee. And they've had a number of those really convincing wins against great teams, whether it's the Thunder they did that to the Nuggets. Obviously, they have that huge win over the Celtics as well. And they've generally like been competitive even when they've lost, as we saw in the two games in Boston. So I think there's a high ceiling for this team. Um, and especially when they have their best guys, and you'd hope that in the playoffs, like that becomes obviously more of the operative thing, playing your best players extended minutes. But as high as that ceiling is, I think we've also seen that the floor um, can be pretty low. And they certainly are a flawed team a flawed roster, especially on the defensive end. And that's why I think understandably, right? Like they're not going to be talked about in the same light as Boston in terms of being that, you know, favorite or co-favorite that, that some people had them coming into the year. So again, like I think to get to the playoffs, like at this point, you know, for most of the year, I think you had three goals, finish second, right? That seemed to be a goal, stay healthy and hopefully get some kind of rhythm going into the playoffs. We'll see if the rhythm part <laughs> happens. Sure. They've had some bumps, but you know, knock on wood, they've seemed like they're finally healthy. And, you know, again, the Knicks and Cavs have been helping with some of their own struggles. So they are still 
in the driver's seat for that two seed. So again, as bad as sort of a lot of the, the, the season has been and rocky as it's been, they're actually reasonably positioned going into the playoffs and then, and then we'll see. Yeah. We're first off, I mean, you've talked about my New York Knicks. We're not able to talk about them right now. It's, um, it's a difficult moment vis-a-vis -vis Josh Hart saying it would be a pleasant surprise to get either OG Ananobi or Julius Randle back in the lineup, which is the kind of thing that you know in your head, but you don't know in your heart. And then someone says it out loud and then you want to go listen to the Smiths for a while. So I chose to do that. Uh, and I might continue to make that choice as we move forward. Um, just to sort of set the table a little bit, as you, you mentioned, that sort of big dividing line with Doc Rivers. The record is 15 and 13, 11th on offense, 12th on defense. Since the All-Star break, it's 12 and 6, 7th on offense, 11th on defense, which is basically just like really clustered in like 8, 9, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. They're basically top 10 on both ends of the ball, outscoring teams by 6.1 points per 100. So like a strong contending profile there. Um, you mentioned the, the cluster in the middle of the East pack there, but yeah, they're two and a half games up on the Cavs, three up on the Knicks, three and a half up on the Magic as we talk here on Tuesday morning. And yeah, they're like, it's an 85 to 90% likelihood in all the projection systems that they're going to finish second. So this is about where you want to be. And I think the, the question is just like, as, you know, as currently constructed, how confident do you feel in their chances in the postseason? And I think that like you laid out a very reasonable case for why there is no reason to doubt it as long as you have everybody healthy uh, or reasonably healthy. And I think obviously the biggest reason for that is Giannis. And now we're going to pull out that pin that we put in the joy of Giannis Adetokounmpo <laughs> earlier. Um, you mentioned the sort of taking it for granted component. Literally, the question that I have here is, do the haters and losers read national media types like me take Giannis for granted? Um, that is a sort of a veiled argument of like a veiled uh, entry point to the MVP conversation, which everybody has their sensibility on it and their uh, in their sense of what the only appropriate agenda and outcome is. I think if I was talking to somebody who uh, primarily discussed the Mavericks or who primarily discussed the Nuggets or who primarily discussed uh, the Thunder, they would have a different viewpoint on where the MVP hierarchy shakes out. Do you buy the general sense that like Giannis is making an MVP push late in the season? Or do you feel like that's kind of like people are just sort of looking for something to talk about? I, I mean, again, the remarkable thing about him is the consistency that he's had all year long, right? So I think certainly, you know, like the losing to the Lakers, blowing that huge lead, you know, AD kind of being the story of the end of that game and the overtimes, that was obviously a blow to any push that he might have been making. You know, he obviously made a, a strong case in that Thunder game. I think his, you know, the record, his record in games against the other top MVP candidates, if you include Embiid, was like five and one or something like that. And he was, you know, putting up monster numbers and generally had outplayed um, you know, the, the other MVP candidates on the opposite side. So, uh, you know, look, he, he's not the kind of guy who's going to come out like Joel has in previous years and said, like, I'm the MVP. Like I want it. I'm it's mine. Like you can tell he wants a third MVP. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say it's like not important to him. I think it is. Sure. Um, I think the recognition he appreciates, but I think he's also wary of, you know, begging for it publicly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think he probably thinks it's like, a little bit unbecoming to to be too thirsty for that MVP. Um, so he's probably more in the, you know, Jokic camp than than the uh, Embiid camp in that regard. Um, but it's funny, I was looking back, you know, because Giannis, obviously, with the amount of fouls he draws, I was curious, you know, like, okay, well, if we take that, you know, end of January-ish, right when the coaching change happens, roughly, I think people have been pointing to that also when roughly maybe the rules started being um, interpreted, um, you know, a bit more in favor of the defense. And I was kind of curious, I was like, well, has, you know, has, you know, has Giannis's numbers, have they dropped off a bit, right? Because if you look at Dame's numbers, his free throws are way down since that happened. Um, his three-point shooting has gone up, but his field goal percentage is pretty much flat. And, you know, overall, it's kind of like, eh, he's still kind of like really good, but not, you know, Dame in all caps. You look at Giannis, 30 points per game on 64.5% true shooting before, <laughs> 30 points per game on 66% true shooting since then, right? Um Again, like you can try to game plan for him. Everybody has different versions of what you try to do to slow him down. But he's just otherworldly in his ability to, you know, use his tools and his skill. And uh, cannot emphasize that enough. In order to, you know, he's a problem solver. I think all the best players 
are problem solvers, right? Like there, there is no way to, to kind of completely shut them down. And, you know, his night to night consistency is, has been remarkable. Um, so I think he just deserves a ton of, ton of credit for that. And again, I think the probably part of the problem with him is, you know, it's like the old, I forget if, I forget who came up with it. If it was Bill Simmons or who came up with like the idea of like the 10% thing with Russell Westbrook, right? Like the flaws are so obvious that it negates the appreciation for what, you know, a superstar does well. And with Giannis, obviously it's a similar story. You know, he's, he never magically became, you know, a 35% three point shooter. Um, you know, his mid range game is kind of still comes and goes. And so I think that's honestly like a, also a big hurdle for him is I think when people construct their MVP narratives, they want to be able to point at and say like, well, you know, early in the year, I was like, well, Joel Embiid, like, look how much better of a passer he he's become. Right. right. Like there's this thing that like, it's almost like, you know, we're like, they're, these are like, we're a teacher and these are our students and we're like, oh, Billy got so much better at this or like Billy worked really hard and he did this. And, you know, the guy who was just acing the test before and just kind of like does it um, because they're just naturally smart or whatever, like, it's just less exciting. Like, oh, good, good job. Keep doing that. Right. Um, you don't really need me to teach you anything. So I think with the honest, there's, there's a lot of that. Um, the fact that he's, in many ways, like he's become even better by just leaning into his strengths rather than necessarily like solving his weaknesses. Like, you know, if he became, if he was back at 75% free throw shooting this year, I think there would be a stronger MVP case or people would buy into the MVP case more. Um, but instead he's just like, you know what, I'm just going to get even better at getting to the rim and dunking and, you know, doing these incredible things that no one else is able to do. And I think his passing and playmaking has gotten better. You know, his, his assist numbers are as high as they've ever been. They're even higher. If you look back at the last few months, around seven assists a game. But again, like, I don't know, just this idea that, like, he's not skilled when he's this level playmaker and some of the passes he's able to make, especially, like, moving up the speed and when he's, you know, facing a defense that's, you know, throwing multiple bodies at him is is pretty, pretty incredible and remarkable. And I, you can tell, like... I feel like his flair for passing has has increased uh, a lot over the past year or so as well. He's always been a good passer. It's always been in his skill set. But um, so again, like you know, has Giannis been making a push? Again, I feel like he's always pushing all year long. That's part of what makes him great. Um, and I don't expect that's going to translate into uh, into hardware. And some of that's you know because I think Jokic coming off a championship, you know, has sort of the the championship belt and you know there's probably a sense that he probably should have been mvp last year anyway and you know with shay and and luca i think there's a novelty factor of they're kind of new to this whole like legit title mvp candidacy in the first place so there's a lot more you know uh excitement let's just say from kind of those quarters of of you know fan bases to to try to get their guy an mvp so with Giannis, yeah i mean it's he's just sort of i guess the neglected like eh yeah, you've been doing this for five years and you're, you know, at this incredible level and you just keep doing it. And so we don't feel like we really, we need to reward that. But again, I think for Giannis, you know, ultimately it's, it's about championships now. So maybe that would be the, you know, high road, the moral, uh, the moral high road sort of he'd be taking. It's like, well, you know, uh, and finals MVPs are, are his number one priority at this point. And it's going to be really difficult to, to get back to the finals, <laughs> let alone win uh, another championship. But obviously I think that's his main concern. And you know, we'll see. I'd love to see him win another MVP, given he's been at such a high level for such a long time. But again, when that happens, unclear. Well, to your point about the skill, you know, knowing your sort of knowledge of self being a skill set too. like, yes, Giannis is ne- has not developed into a 35 percent three point shooter. He's also just he's taking fewer of them and he's mm-hmm. saying, like, I'm going to use um, these shoulders and these strides and the, these elbows and these this everything to get to the front of the rim more. And the, one of my favorite, like, just blows my mind when I look at it, numbers here, like, he's top five, it, pick your alphabet soup advanced number, all in one metric, whatever, he's top five in that, all those top four, top three, whatever. Um, he has 206 more points in the paint than anybody else in the league. It's Jokic's two, and he has 206 more points in the paint than Jokic. Um, now th- that's not to say that that's a declarative st- uh, statement about anything else other than just that number blows my mind. Um, he averages 20.7 points per game in the paint, um, even before you get to the free throw line or anywhere else, which is just bonkers, not, you know, mind blowing stuff. Feelings is a thing we do here on this show. So I'm wondering just your general feeling on this. 
Giannis has been super vocal about the challenges of this season. You know, he recently told Sammy Mick of The Athletic that it's been like the hardest year of his career. To what degree do you think he has to wear that this time around? You know, given the, obviously, yes, the, he was injured in the in the, the the loss to the Heat in the first round, but you know, another early exit. Mike Budenholzer goes out. Adrian Griffin comes in. If not directly at Giannis's behest, then at least it certainly sounds like, and from the reporting, um, with his approval, uh, his blessing, things don't go super hot the first you know few months of the season. Giannis is giving quote after quote after quote post game about how we don't know what we're doing and we don't seem to have any plan. Um, I'm not going to be the guy swinging the hatchet, but I am going to give you chapter and verse every night about how we don't know what we're doing. Um, the, you know, you mentioned earlier the off season sort of media, not, I wouldn't say media campaign, but multiple interviews where he's like, I need to feel the, um, commitment from the organization. And I need to know that we're all pulling in the same direction, which then leads to the Dame trade and the downstream effects of that. And, losing Drew Holiday and Grayson Allen and reconfiguring the team, the point of attack issues, all that kind of stuff. How much of that do you think, uh, not in terms of like a wars candidacy or whatever, but like Giannis has been the feel good, you know, Superman candidate for however many years. Like, does he have to wear any of that as sort of a, a you know, a black hat a little bit in terms of his own uh, path through his career? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there was... Uh, you know, I certainly heard it, bef- you know, before the Heat series that for a while that, you know, Giannis slash Giannis's camp um, was not the biggest fan of Bud at that point, right? That it felt like if there was another disappointment, that there was a high likelihood that certainly, you know, Giannis and, and again, like I I would imagine the same may be true of, of other veterans on the team, except Brooke Lopez, right? Like Brooke Lopez would never want anybody to get fired. Um sure. But, uh, but I mean, that, that kind except of, except his brother, except his brother, <laughs> he wouldn't mind seeing him lose a job. <laughs> Mission accomplished there. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that, you know, I think you can even go back to that, right? Like did Giannis take for granted what he had a bit with Bud in that team? Um, but also I think, you know, th- there's, there's shelf lives on coaches too. Right. So I think part of it is, um, you know, that there's a shelf life on coaches, um, you know, I think to, to what, I, I don't know who I can attribute to Seth part now, Nate Duncan, everybody always kind of cites the, you know, fair ain't got nothing to do with it. I don't know the original stater of that, uh, that, uh, that term, that phrase, but, um, but that certainly felt like it was the case with, with Bud. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, look, did, did, uh, Giannis put Adrian Griffin in the final three for that coaching position? No. Right. Like to the extent that John Horst and company, put Adrian Griffin in the final three and gave him a meeting with Giannis and then sought Giannis's feedback on whether or not, you know, you like this guy versus that guy. And, you know, maybe Pascal Siakam um, and OG uh, apparently uh, didn't give warm uh, uh, endorsements of Nick Nurse uh, that may have shaded his opinion of Nick Nurse. I mean, look, probably a lot of that went into their ultimate decision to, to hire Adrian Griffin. And so, yeah, I think, you know, um, given the way things went, um, you know, I think you obviously have to look at, at the entire process and Giannis was a part of that process. So, um, you know, John Horst, I think correctly will try to take all the bullets for the decision-making process and all that. But, you know, I think when you're at Giannis's level, yeah, of course, like things are going to happen and you're going to be in the loop on those things. And if you didn't want those things to happen, they probably wouldn't have happened. Right. You know, I think, I don't think they trade for Dame if they thought, I don't, again, I don't think they were necessarily asking Giannis like, hey, should we trade Grayson, uh, Drew, and X, Y, and Z for Damian Lillard? Give us a thumbs up and we'll do it. But I think they also knew that that would be a move that he would approve of. And lo and behold, he signs his huge extension unexpectedly You know, a few weeks later. So kind of worked out in that, in that regard, certainly. Sure. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think he has to own it to, to some extent. But again, I think like, to frame him as like, you know, a coach killer or something like that. I mean, I think like, okay, guys, let's, let's calm down a little bit uh, in that regard too. So look, I think the, the, you know, the, the part of the deal when you're at Giannis's level and you've been at that level for so long, everybody tries to find, you know, ways that maybe you're not the, the perfect, you know, smoothie drinking, uh, you know, joy tweeting a uh, 19 year old that, that you once were. And so I think that's just part of kind of, the reality of being a superstar, but you know, again, like uh, I, I don't give a lot of thought to it. And I think Giannis 
the quote you started with, right? I mean, Giannis is a guy who I think is very good at, at being kind of present and in the moment and focusing on kind of what you can do moving forward rather than kind of what happened in litigating the past. So, um, you know, again, all that's kind of done and dusted. Would they have wanted to hire Doc Rivers a year, you know, last summer <laughs> in, in May? Probably not. That's why he probably, you know, wasn't interviewed, even though they interviewed a ton of people. But I think they're here now. And I think, you know, again, I think the veterans are generally happy with where they are now, at least with kind of who they've got in that locker room. And obviously they, the, the players have a lot to prove. Doc Rivers has a lot to prove. And, you know, that's what the crucible of the playoffs is all about, right? Just seeing how guys react to matchups, pressure, et cetera. And, and there's certainly going to be a lot of pressure on this team and likely from the first round on, just given some of the teams that are likely going to be, you know, in the bracket with them in the seven, eight spot. Let's stay there because I'm interested in your, your viewpoint on the doc rivers version of the team. Um, you know, much was made in the immediate aftermath of like, you know, Doc being like, well, this is the hardest thing anyone's ever been asked to do in the history of human endeavor. <laughs> no one's had a tougher job <laughs> than taking this team over midstream. Um, and like, you know, the m- quotes that seemed a little bit like, why did you agree to do this? Um, but more recently, you know, defense has up has uh, trended up in a lot of the ways that, you know, you talked about systematizing a team. You know, the transition game that was an issue, not as an issue, as much of an issue anymore. Defensive rebounding, top five in that area, you know, improved in terms of defense at the rim and how frequently they're giving up shots at the rim, points in the paint allowed, all these sorts of things. And then the offense has been much more heavily geared toward more Damon pick and roll, more Damon pick and roll, reps, 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 reps. Um, Do you feel more confident in this team moving into the playoffs with Doc Rivers at the helm than you would have? previously and i guess sort of what is your confidence level with a doc rivers led version of the team (laughs) given doc rivers uh movies that we've seen in the past i mean definitely more confident than i was you know through the first half of the season um because again like just the whispers and the what Giannis and the team was saying you know in post games like the writing was on the wall that that again adrian griffin was not ready to be doing this job with this team, maybe, you know, a, a younger team, maybe Adrian Griffin could have figured things out, but um, there wasn't any, you know, you don't have a, a ramp up period when the expectations are as high as they are with this team and you've got, you know, a ticking clock on your window, right? I mean, with Middleton and Brooks contracts and Dame and his age, I mean, I, I viewed it from the start of the season. Like it's pretty much a two year window, right? And then potentially even this summer coming summer, Things could change dramatically depending on how the playoffs go this year. And certainly you would expect that things will change dramatically probably a year on from from where we are now. So so I think again, it'll just I think Doc's brought just a degree of calmness and professionalism. And again, so much of it is just honestly like players know him, they know what they're gonna get. You know, he's I think been a good communicator with this group. And you know, the low hanging fruit, I think, piece, which you alluded to a couple of them, right? Get back in transition, right? Don't crash the offensive glass so much. Okay, you know, their offensive rebound rate is down a little bit. Fine, right? Is that part of why their offense has fallen off a little bit? Yeah, I'm sure it's maybe a small contributor. But the transition defense has gotten much better to the point of, you know, A, not being horrible, um, and B, trending towards actually pretty good, which is where they've historically been. Um, Cleaning up, you know, the defensive glass, as you referenced, right? Like, we always talk about, you know, Bud's job was really about taking the low-hanging fruit when he took over for Jason Kidd, who, you know, had no interest in in fruit, regardless of where it hung. Um, and now, you know, I think for Doc, it was a lot of that same thing. It was just basically saying like, all right, guys, let's get back on D, defensive rebound. And I think some of the engagement we've seen, um, you know, it's interesting, like he, some of the things he's done have not been like you think of him and you would say like, well, Doc Rivers is certainly more conservative than Adrian Griffin, who was the architect of this, you know, weird Raptors defense these last few years. But, you know, like a lot of like what kind of some things that they've done that have been successful, you know, has been like they've done at times against like superstars, they've done like more trapping and stuff that you do not think of as being conservative. Right. They still have Bobby Portis play pretty aggressive on defense, which, you know, again, I don't, is there a good way to play Bobby Portis on defense? Like to be determined um, at this point, I think it's I, giving him more shots. I think that's the best way to be, to play Bobby Portis on defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, 
So again, like I, I don't know that like a lot of you know some things like against the Thunder, they started doing a lot of off ball switching, which they really have not done all season. But you know they were switching one through four, or perhaps more accurately one through Brook Lopez. You know, like pretty much everybody <laughs> but Brook switches. Um, they did a, they were doing that pre Doc. They've been doing that since Doc. Um, but I think a lot of it's just more kind of in the weeds, right? Like they've talked about how they've gotten more physical with their switching, right? So trying to go from lazy switching, right, to bringing a physicality and like actually when you switch, like actually make the other team feel it a little bit. Don't just be doing like, oh, okay, I don't, I just don't want to get over a screen. Um, so things like that, you know, Pat Bev took credit for the off ball switching and was talking about, you know, how he kind of likes it because it forces them to, to talk more. Um, and, you know, again, like you can kind of fall into this trap, I think, with Chris and Giannis in particular, like they're not big talkers on defense. Brooke Lopez talks some. Um, Drew wasn't a big talker on defense. Um, And I think, you know, certainly Pat Beverly is a talker in all mediums. Um, (laughs) Shout out the Pat Bev pod. Um, But uh, so I I think again, like, you know, the, I think Doc's been one of the reasons for kind of the switch into a more balanced type of team. And it's kind of funny in previous years, like, you know, the concern in the playoffs was always like the offense basically went in the toilet. And that was the reason why this team, when they failed, typically failed. And the defense typically was not really the issue. And, you know, now it's kind of ironic because the defense has kind of gotten back to, you know, slightly above average. um, And the offense has kind of taken a little bit of a step back. But I'd say most Bucks fans are happy with that trade-off because we spent so much of the first half of the season worried, like, could they defend at all? And I still think there's huge questions in a playoff series where you, you know, teams can basically, you know, obviously go through rounds of, of adjustments and can really target weak links. You know, are you going to be able to do what they've been doing night to night with switching and things like that um, against teams in the playoffs? I think that's to be determined. I think there's certainly, I would say that's certainly probably still my biggest concern. Um, But overall, I think they are in a much better spot. And like I said, Knock on wood for them. They can get the two seed. Who knows who they're going to have to face in the first round. I personally feel like if it's Miami, bring it on, right? Like, I mean. I like it. Like, I, like, I like the mentality. I mean, the same thing happened in 2020 and 21. They lost in the second round against the Heat in the bubble. It was this big come down for a team that had an historically awesome regular season. And they basically said, like, screw it. Like, we're not going to try to, you know, play games with the seeding. If we need to play the Heat, we'll play the Heat. And, you know, Chris Middleton hits a uh, overtime game winner in the first game, and then they just roll them 4-0, right? So is that going to happen this time in a similar fashion? They bounce back from a loss to the Heat with a convincing win? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to put money on, on that quite yet, but I would expect them to beat the Heat. And um, again, we'll see. I, I feel... I feel similar, honestly, to the way I've done, I've felt in a lot of other years where, you know, do I trust this team is going to go through four rounds and be at their peak in four straight playoff rounds? No. I think there's enough flaws, certainly in this year, especially defensively, that they're going to need a lot of luck. But again, I think that's part of what winning a championship, you kind of get an appreciation for. Like some things have to break your way. Some things are going to go against you. Um, And at the end of the day, like, you know, you're just going to have to win close games and make plays and hope that you don't get catastrophic injuries and things like that. So uh, do they have a a good chance, as good a chance as any team in the East not named Boston? I would say yes. But again, I think Boston has shown enough during this regular season that they absolutely, you know, are the kind of default team at this point going into the playoffs, right? They've shown enough. And any any Celtics fan that tries to tell you, I feel like I've seen a couple examples of like Celtics fans sort of like hinted that somehow like the pressure is not on the Boston Celtics to win the title this year or to come out of the East. Like, <laughs> get out of here. Like the pressure is on you guys. There is pressure on the Bucs, of course, but um, certainly the weight of expectations, I think, is is on the Celtics. And again, if you're the Bucs, honestly, I think in some ways that probably serves them better because every time they've had the best record in the league, <laughs> They've disappointed at some point, right? <laughs> so right. we found from, uh, the, we found the market inefficiency. Don't yeah. be the best team in the league. You know, exactly. if, you, if if you can just avoid that simple pitfall, uh, you know, who knows what kind of riches might await you after the fact. That's that's but I mean, but it's always been my secret. Whenever my you know wife asks you like, why aren't you better at things? I just say like, that's the that's my secret. <laughs> I'm not good at things. Lower expectations, over deliver question mark, question mark, question mark, profit, right? Um, so <laughs> we'll see right. if we'll see if the Bucks can use that same that same recipe again this year. It's worked worked once before at least.
I love that. Yeah. Uh, how Doc Rivers fills in the question mark, question mark, question mark is always one of the, the biggest things to watch in any postseason. So I look forward to learning more about that. Um, we are going to take a quick break to uh, pay some bills, and then we are going to be right back with some more Divine Intervention with Frank Madden. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Divine Intervention. I'm here with Frank Madden of the Locked On Bucks podcast. And Frank, we're going to move now into the closing five, because as I'm sure you know, how you start is not nearly as important as how you finish. Five questions for our illustrious guest starting now. Question number one, you have two young daughters. Uh, the youngest, not quite a year old now, right? Almost a year old? Correct. Yep. 11 months. I try to ask this of every parent that comes on the show because I am as also a parent of two small kids. Um, what is the children's media that has you in a headlock right now? And uh, how are you holding up against it? Well, thankfully, um, my my 11 month old, like just, you know, just creates chaos and like isn't really consuming media yet. Um, my six year old uh, definitely has an iPad that I use liberally to, you know, circumvent the need to parent. Um, so <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like the, the most uh, obvious thing, I think what most parents, um, these days would say is like the, the good media, you know, Bluey is, is a favorite, um, sure. and shout out to Kane Pittman, my former co-host at Locked on Bucks, um, my favorite Australian. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've joked about Kane being only like these, my second favorite Australian behind Hugh Jackman, um. <laughs> But I think with Bluey, he's now my third favorite Australian export. <laughs> um, so I'll say I'll say Bluey being the the best children's TV show. Uh, although I'm I'm trying to get my kid, my daughter, my my older daughter into like Star Wars and stuff like that, and she's taking the bait a little bit. So that's so that's been fun. I will say, be careful what you wish for on Star Wars because so we do family movie nights pretty much every weekend, right? And so and we every we rotate. So there's I have a nine year old and a six year old. And they each get to pick. And, you know, like after they get their, you know, done, then me and my wife pick one and we rotate. When they started to get into Star Wars, it became every weekend Star Wars. And for a minute, you're like, that's pretty great. And then when you're on like the ninth watch of episode two, you're like, I kind of want to, you know, take a lightsaber to my temple and not watch too much more Hayden Christensen in this or any lifetime. Um, but you have to make sure you have to give, make your peace with it and be like, they're sharing interests. They're engaged. They're learning things. Now, also, I know that I probably shouldn't have shown the little one um, the Obi-Wan Anakin fight because then she had nightmares about lava <laughs> planets and men with no bodies. And so, like, that's a thing you learn as you move along. Um, but, uh, yes, Bluey, thumbs up. Uh, you know, all due respect to Kane, I would also put him lower on the list of uh, Australian exports. Important that children know the benefits of the high ground, though. You know, you got to <laughs> you got to school them in that early. We were playing a, another uh, like card game recently where you have to come up. It's called Super Fight. And you have to come up with uh, a here's in this competition. Here's why my fighter would win. And I was like, well, he's dropping out of a helicopter. So, you know, he's got the high ground. And my kids are like, mm, smart. Got it. Understand. Uh, all right. Good turn on social media, oh, no, sorry, on children's media. Question number two, something of a sharp pivot given where we just came from, but um, how uncomfortable does it make it, does it make you every time you have to say belt to ass tour? Uh, or conversely, do you kind of love Pat Bev specifically for stuff like this? Uh, definitely a big fan of the hashtag belt to ass tour. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, anything that gives a 43 year old washed up dad permission to be talking about using the phrase belt to ass. Um, That's right. You can't, you can't ask for much more than that. So yeah, I, it's kind of funny. I don't think the um, plus minus numbers, I haven't checked them in the last week or so. I don't think they've been too kind to uh, Pat Bev so far uh, in Milwaukee, but um, I think just the vibes, you know, the vibes, yes. the Pat Bev vibes, I think have been, uh, have been important. Um, and, you know, he started the other night in Atlanta bucks were 0 and five without Dame when he sat, uh, and Pat, you know, torn wrist ligament be damned. Um, you know, I was saying Ewing theory, apply it to Pat Bev's wrist ligament. Who <laughs> needs it? Uh, he scores 18 points, five assists, five rebounds. And, you know, I think the Pox were like giving him like five foot floaters because they were just like, yeah, you can't make that. And he was just like, I can, I can now that I've been freed from the shackles of this wrist ligament. So, um, shout out to Pat Bev. He's been, uh, a joy to watch. And he's, he's coming for all of our jobs with his podcasting as well. So, um, you know, podcasting, he breaks his own news, right? Like he broke the Gallo signing. 
hindsight wish that wasn't a thing that had to be broken but you know it is what it is um <laughs> so yeah the pad bev experience has been a joy and I've, I'm a long time appreciator because again, my wife being a Rockets fan, she loved Pat Bev when he was in Houston. And so I enjoyed the stylings, uh, the artistic stylings of Pat Bev back then. And it felt like it was only a matter of time before at some point he would end up in Milwaukee. So we'll see if it's beyond, you know, the next month or two. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly would love it if he, uh, if he was able to come back for another year after this. And I feel like there's no matter how long it lasts, there's a real like, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened thing to having <laughs> Pat Bev. It's, it seems like every fan base that has had him is like, man, Pat Bev, what a good, what a guy. Always, all, always going to be, never going to have to buy a drink in our town. You know, always Pat Bev appreciation. That's on the the front of the Pat Bev belt to ask tour is that, <laughs> that, uh, that beautiful little statement that you just, you just reeled off. So, um, it's all about the journey, man. That's exactly right. It is all about the journey. Uh, part of your journey, question number three, um, having followed you on Twitter for a long time, I've become familiar with your affection for a specific regional food chain. <laughs> for those of us who have not spent much time in Wisconsin, please tell us about Rocky Rococo's and why it <laughs> occupies such a special place in your heart. Well, see, it's funny because I, you know, you forget that I'm tweeting this and there are people who are not familiar and did not grow up in Wisconsin that read my tweets. So I'm kind of impressed slash saddened that you, that I've, I've bludgeoned my Twitter <laughs> followers with so much Rocky Rococo content. Rocky Rococo's is a Madison uh, pizza chain, which uh, is only really available in Wisconsin. They may, they had a random location in like Washington for a long time for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, they're like, they do like pizza by the slice. You can get full pizza as well. It's like pan, kind of pan pizza. It's like a hint of sweetness. And I don't know, I, I had it like every Friday growing up, um, I would go to the mall and we'd get a Rocky or Coco's pizza. And it's funny, like after I left Wisconsin, I went to the East Coast for college. I live in Texas now. Um, I kind of would be like, man, I want to have some Rocky Rococo. It's like, there's just something about it. Like, it's not like the highest end pizza, but I just like loved it. And it has this nostalgic feeling. And I found, and I realized that I am not the only one who feels this way. And I've of course connected with all of my people on Twitter about this, my friends, <laughs> you know, it like became a thing when one of us goes home and has a slice, we take a picture and put it on the group text. So yeah, it is, I, I have no idea if you're a, a normal adult with good taste and you parachute into a Rockies <laughs> right now. Like, I don't know how how you, how much you would like it or think it's okay. Uh, but to me, it is uh, the pinnacle of uh, fast casual dining. And every time I go to Wisconsin, I eat an embarrassing amount of it and including like sneaking off, you know, it's like, oh, I got to run some errands. And then I just, you know, slink off to uh, to grab a slice at Rocky. So shout out to Rocky Rococo's. Um, not, uh, not something to be missed, uh, if you're ever in Wisconsin, the heading out to go do something and then also sneaking your food preference is a real father's gambit. That is, that is truly, uh, the, the, the dad's delight to go and get that slice of pizza. <laughs> and also your point about, uh, I, I don't know if it would play with a, if you are a reasonable adult with great taste, reasonable adults with great taste. I don't listen to this podcast anyway, so let's not <laughs> worry too much about that. Frank, uh, question number four. To what degree is your daily level of happiness tethered to the health of Chris Middleton's lower limbs? <sighs> Probably more than than I would like it to be. Um, like more than a doctor would recommend. Yeah. I mean, it, it's always, it's funny. I, I feel like there are guys like this for every team in every sport. Like the guys who are like superficially, like people from the outside would be like, oh, that guy's been a great player for you. Like, you know, your fans must love him. And then you talk in, to people within that fan base and you realize like there's a much more tortured sort of dialogue around that guy. Sure. And Chris is, has been that guy for quite a while, basically ever since he signed probably his like first enormous contract, which I think it was in 2019, I want to say. Um, you know, there were people saying like, oh, d let him walk. Like they should have signed Brogdon, kept Brogdon and sent right. Chris Milton packing. Um, you know, there's that, the, there's always this like part of a fan base that like is very aggrieved that like, you know, young men who play basketball are getting paid enormous amounts of money and, you know, don't, don't like that. And Chris has sort of fallen into that camp, I think with some people, um, you know, there was always the, he's never going to be good enough to be a number two on a championship team. Checkbox. Yeah, right. About and, that. And then even after that, it was immediately, like, there's still some people who are like, oh, well, he, you know, he's like, he can't do that again, right? It's like, well, he was <laughs> awesome in the NBA finals, right? Like, how about that, right? He has, I think he has as many 40-point finals games as Kobe Bryant, guys. One. Wow. But, hey, you know. There's a number. Um, so, anyway, um, 
Yeah, I think Chris is, he's obviously in a different stage of his career than he was three, four years ago. I think it's an open question, right? Can he get to the heights that he did during that that playoff run? Um, you know, interestingly, he was banged up dealing with this knee problem all of last year um, that required off-season surgery, which seems to have like really kind of, I don't want to say cured is all of his ills, but, you know, really kind of took away significant pain that he was feeling. Sure. Um, but despite that, I mean, he put up great numbers in the heat series last year, kind of forgotten to history, given what happened with the loss. But, you know, he, he showed up in that series and, you know, this year he started off with a minutes restriction, but, you know, again, you look at sort of his permanent numbers, his efficiency numbers, they're pretty much where he's been the last few years. And, you know, again, like he's had some clunkers, right. He finished the game against the Lakers really poorly as did pretty much everybody on the bus. Sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, then bounced back, hit nine out of 10, you know, kind of played, played big against the Hawks and, and really helped them win a game when, you know, they've really struggled without, without Dame Lillard. So, so I will always be a Chris Milton appreciator. There's a, a very vocal, I would say majority of Bucks fans that do fall into that camp, you know, given his age, he's 32, you know, he's got two years left after this on his contract. What is his long-term future? question mark, right? He's he's absolutely going to have his number retired in Milwaukee. But again, I think certainly him sliding into the number three spot in the pecking order, I think is generally a very good thing. But again, you know, I don't think Damon Giannis can, can win a championship by themselves either. His playmaking is is absolutely essential. And I think, you know, people who kind of don't really follow the Bucks closely probably don't appreciate like, again, what he's able to do as, as a passer, right? Everybody thinks of him as a shooter, best mid-range shooter in the league this year. But his again, we mentioned earlier, like his connection with Giannis and Brooke Lopez as well. Again, and he just knows kind of where those guys are at all times. You know, knows that you can just throw the ball up to Giannis from all angles, and and he can go get it. And um, again, he's just been essential to this Bucks team. And I think most importantly, he's been moving better on defense. I think after some wobbly moments early in the season, so he's not a stopper, um, but he's a smart player. And and again, I think obviously, as you said, his his health is is obviously essential. And uh, that's obviously been something that, you know, at least a couple of years ago cost them dearly in that series they lost against Boston. A couple of numbers to put to that. Um, he's been, so I, I think, six games since coming back from that left ankle sprain, the most recent issue that he's had. Uh, just under 16 points, six and a half rebounds and seven assists a game, 50, 38, 91 shooting like take that obviously every day of the week um, with understanding that the scoring could even go up to a higher level if you needed it to uh, in greater minutes and more workload. But Getting that out of your number three guy who you can ensure that now you've got two plus scoring threats and playmakers on the floor at get any given time um, would be ma- you know massive in a playoff setting. Um, the Bucs have been really good with Giannis, Dame, and Brooke Lopez on the floor. They are at their best, obviously, though, with Chris Middleton added to that group, plus 15.5 points per 100 possessions this season. Um, one of the big swing factors in the league. So your happiness or uh, depression uh, vacillating <laughs> dramatically based on his presence and the health of his lower legs, I would not blame you for that. I can understand the reason for it. Uh, question number five, you tweeted about raiding your daughter's Easter basket. Um <laughs> coming across a red starburst and then being frustrated at finding out that it was a watermelon starburst when you expected a strawberry. I think we can all understand that frustration. I certainly empathize with it. I'm more interested, though, in the rules of the game in your house. (laughs) When do you consider it acceptable to begin raiding the candy basket? Um, How much are you taking initially? Like, does that increase over time? When does it become a free for all? How does it work with your in the the Madden household in terms of the candy uh, redistribution, shall we say? I mean, I feel like the dad tax can be levied at any time. Um, That's exactly right. You know, this is uh, this is an autocratic uh, society we live in. Um, <laughs> there are no rules. Um, you know, my wife went out and got the candy. And when she brought it back, I saw that the Reese's eggs bag had already been opened. So she already took one for her. So I was like, <laughs> OK, cool. Down with that. So I took one as well. Uh, and we, you know, we got all the Easter eggs, 17 Easter eggs. We, we got stuff in them. My wife did the hard work. And then, uh, yeah, I think from then on, pretty much any time my child is not watching her Easter basket is open season for me to uh, to eat some of that. Although, importantly, we also had sort of some leftover stuff that we didn't put in it that we kept in a cupboard. So um, I don't know. I, I try not to uh, be too open about it um, because I don't want her giving me grief for it. But uh, she'll, she'll, she's pretty good about, about sharing. And, uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see. But I will say that on the, the, the Starburst question, in theory... Everybody thinks it's great. Oh, Starburst with only the, the the red and the pink. Sign me up for that. Well, but they put the fruit punch, which is good, and these watermelon ones in there as well in these these favorite bags. 
and the watermelons look like identical to the strawberry. So guess what? I'm just not eating any strawberry because I just can't. I don't want to have to try to stare at these these wrappers. So, um, <laughs> so pretty much my daughter's Easter basket at this point is just watermelon and strawberry starburst at this point because I <laughs> I can't be bothered to to try to pick out the uh, the strawberry. So so far she hasn't complained. So you know what? As long as uh, I'm not I'm not getting complaints, I'm I'm good. That's exactly right. I mean, when in doubt, uh, the answer is just you know I, I'm the one who provides for the candy entry into the into the system although then you have to you start dealing with magical bunny and there's a lot to consider in terms of how you communicate that to your child but the idea of one for the, you know one extra for the dad i think is a completely fair way of, of uh, administering that kind of tax um we move from uh recommendations for how to best thieve candy from your children to a weekly recommendation, something we do on Divine Intervention each week, uh, does not have to be about basketball at all. Uh, something that you think is cool and good that the people would enjoy, maybe make their day 1% better. Examples in the past have included all manner of books, TV shows, and movies, uh, popsicles, going to the library, taking a walk, cooking dinner for somebody to show them that you care about them. Lots of great choices here. Frank Madden, what is your recommendation for the people? Yeah, I'm I'm a big pop culture media person. Um, I don't I still don't know exactly how I consume as much as I do, given I have two children um, and I podcast about basketball and all that. Um, uh, the answer, of course, is benign neglect of the children. Yeah, this is exactly. how this is how we wind up taking <laughs> exactly. so much. In. I I might have given you a recommendation for the the show Shogun on Hulu, but uh, you know mm. what? It turns out watching a subtitled show about like you know murder and death in feudal Japan is hard to watch while you've got like two kids running around yes. uh, on a Saturday <laughs> morning. So I have not gotten very far in that, although it seems promising. Um, I, I've tweeted about the three body problem. I've tweeted about the the trilogy of books that uh, inspired it a few times in the past uh, on my Twitter. So like, if you're really deep uh, on my Twitter following, you may recall me talking about that. But I'm a huge fan of the books. It's hard sci-fi. Um, but also, I, I do think as much as uh, si Xin Liu is not a like character emotions guy. Uh, he's an engineer by trade. Um, I do think, uh, especially in the second and third books, uh, it gets into certain sort of aspects of the human spirit and things like that, which I think are amazing and emotional and um, are really incredible. So I was nervous about the translation, the adaptation of these books into film uh, because I wasn't sure exactly how they were going to do that. Uh, but I've watched all of season one. I've started a rewatch already, actually. And I think, especially if you like the books, um, I think you're generally going to be happy with the adaptation. I think they've kind of constructed in a way that really makes sense. And we were you were talking earlier when we were uh, not recording, uh, alluding to The Ringer and, and them doing a lot of content about it. I think Zach Cram wrote probably the definitive article about it, which talked about like why he loves the books and also some of the reasons why the adaptation, he, he's a big fan of it. So, uh Give it a give it a taste. Um, again, I've only seen it having read the books, which I feel like has made it a more enjoyable because I can already see some of the through lines through the subsequent books. Seems like most people are liking it. Your mileage may vary, but um, but I, I definitely give that one a recommendation. And a couple of like a more under the radar ones. I mean, lots of people have been talking about three body problem. A couple of like very under the radar shows, which did not come out recently, but I'll just throw them out because I don't think they got talked about enough. The English, which is a, I think it's Prime. Um, it's a mini series about um, the basically Native American territory and 19th century. Uh, Emily Blunt is in it. Um, it's a mm. just beautifully shot experience of a TV show. It's pretty short. I think it's like six episodes. Um, and uh, it's just extremely well done. And I thought it was great and it didn't get a ton of, got great reviews, but didn't get a ton of um, chatter when it came out. So the English, I would say, recommend that. Maybe because the title is confusing because it's like referencing sure. a couple English people that go to the American kind of West and, and Native American territory. But that one's great. And then um, an Apple Blackbird, um, which got some award buzz. But I thought that's basically it's about a um, a drug dealer who goes to jail and has to become an informant to try to nail a, um, you know, murderer, essentially uh, another awesome TV show, which I thought was really well done. Again, miniseries. There's never going to be another sequel to it, whatever. But it's out there. If you've got Apple TV Plus, um, I enjoyed it a lot. So I'll, I'll get there. There's my three my three recommendations for uh, things that that I'm enjoying. 
That's incredible. You come bear not only bearing gifts, but bearing three of them. Like, God bless you. What a wonderful thing to, to give to the people um, who who've stuck around here. I only have one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it's, I don't know if it's that my media diet is struggling or just that I'm out of uh, out of joy, but we're going to cr- try to crank it up here. Um, <laughs> you gave me new things that are airing on, you know, broadcast or on, you know, streaming platforms now. I'm giving you a song from 1978. There we go. Um, or next 77, I believe. Teenage Kicks by The Undertones is my weekly recommendation. It is a two and a half minute song. You can probably finish listening to it by the time I get done talking about it. Um, five friends get together in Derry, Northern Ireland in the mid 1970s. They form a band, start playing gigs in early 1976, and a year and a half later write what still might be the best punk song ever written. Um, it is two, I guess I had two minutes, 25 seconds, distorted guitars, hand claps, some change jangling in your pocket, an earworm of daydreams about a girl you'd like to go out with. It is about as simple and to the point, a reduced fraction of a rock song as there is, uh, absolute diamond to me. I, I love it. It makes me happier every time I listen to it. Uh, I am not alone in this because the legendary BBC radio DJ, John Peel, when the let story goes, when the single first got to him, he played it twice in a row because, quote, it doesn't get much better than this. Uh, decades later, John Peel told The Guardian that he had told his wife when he died, the only words he wanted on his tombstone besides his name were the opening lines of the song. Teenage dreams so hard to beat. And after he died in 2004, that's exactly what happened. She put that on the grave marker and it sticks there. Uh, hard to beat. I agree. Listening to Teenage Kicks makes my day 1% better. It might make your day 1% better as well. Another thing that's going to make your day 1% better, especially if you are engaged in the love of the Milwaukee Bucks, is listening to the Locked On Bucks podcast, uh, starring, co-starring at least, uh, our guest today, Frank Madden. Frank, is there anything else you would like to point the people to on the way out the door? Uh, no, you can follow me on Twitter at FMaddenNBA. You can get lots of uh, regional food takes. Um, Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> In addition to uh, occasional uh, dipping my toe into the water of uh, uh, media recommendations as well, but mostly mostly basketball. Um, so so yeah, thanks for having me, Dan. This has been fun to to catch up and um, you know again uh, I'll I'll owe you a beer the next time I see you. Probably not in at Sloan uh, the next time, but probably not. Maybe, maybe maybe some other maybe some other place. Maybe if maybe in the next maybe Knicks Knicks Bucks Knicks Bucks. Uh, I don't know what round of the playoffs that would be. Uh, but you know, I don't know, second round of the playoffs, maybe two, three matchup. Um, we can put aside our differences. Maybe. I think I'll need to drink pretty heavily if that's the matchup, (laughs) but we'll go from there. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of divine intervention. Thanks so much to Frank Madden for taking all this time to be with us and to reconnect with himself and Rocky Rococo's. Thank you so much to super producer, John Gennaro for everything that he does to make this show look and sound as good as it does. Vinny Goodwill will be back with a new episode of The Good Word tomorrow here on the Ball Don't Lie podcast feed. And I will be back with Jake Fisher on No Cap Room on Thursday. I think that's about it. Thanks so much for listening and take care of yourself. You deserve it. (laughs) 